as you can see, I'm going to, just going to speak off the cuff, as they say. On Mr. State, Pamsek, Chairman of uh, EMT Committee, Chairman of the Guild of Medical Directors, Chairman of the Association of Private Medical and General Practitioners, past Chairman, Medical Directors here, their own persons, Directors in the hospital, ladies and gentlemen. We are here gathered because of a necessity. What we have in common is that we are all components of the health sector, the private and the public. I can say for myself that I have had the privilege of working in all areas. I have worked in the public at the University of Benin Teaching Hospital. I worked with a company. I worked for Shell for several years. I was a, uh, a divisional surgeon in the hospital in Wari, and I was also in the private sector. So I've seen it from all sides. You can see medicine. I've seen from all angles. I also worked in Nigeria, I've worked outside. So I've seen medicine from different areas. But so I can give my opinion in many things. The health sector is in trouble. We all agree on that. But we're also fortunate to be working for someone who wants to see things move, and that's the President of the Republic. He is a person who wants, who promised to bring changes into the country. And personally, I believe that nation building is not just building bridges and roads and things, but building people. And that's human capital development. And the cornerstone of human capital development is the health sector. And that's why ministers are giving the charge to do what we can for human capital development. Now, there have been issues, of course. Uh, in many attempts to develop the health sector, the agreement that was reached for 50% Abuja declaration to the health sector was very difficult to fulfill for practical reasons. And if you ask, they tell you Nigeria has deficits everywhere. We are the country we have made a lot of money from oil, but we have deficits, infrastructure deficits everywhere. There is not one factory or industry that's set up here that's working today, whether it's the steel mill, the refinery. We, ju we just have not been able to get anything going in this country. And therefore, there's a lot to catch up. You have to catch up. Roads, railway. We had railway, it collapsed. We had an airline, we had a shipping line. There are many things we started off with which are just not there. So Nigeria is in the process of rebuilding. And I think this, this government has a... Give the credit to rebuild. And part of the difficulty is that it comes at a very difficult time. Oil price is low. And to make matters worse, COVID has hit the country in a way that it has crippled everything. But in the middle of all that, we must still move on. It is true that it offers an excellent opportunity to restart many things. And we are restarting the health sector in its own ways. Not just restarting in the sense of rebuilding things, but also creating new things. And this creation, the way the structure of the country is, is that we have the primary health care sector, the secondary, the tertiary, the specialty hospitals. But what we didn't have is an emergency medical system that connects all, and patient transport system that connects all of these together. I've been told that we're the third country in Africa to be building an emergency medical system, an ambulance, uh, emergency medical service, a national emergency medical service and ambulance system. The unique thing about it is that this is a service where the patient is actually the one begging you to come and help him. In routine service, we, are talk we talk of demand, where you patient goes to the hospital, and they don't, so we complain that they don't come. The, the chairman there said just now that they don't come until the last minute, and others, when it's an emergency. But before it's an emergency, they won't go. 
We build primary healthcare centers and we say, oh, they don't go there because the attendance is just two or three people in a day. It, 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 the demand is low. But in emergency, that's when you know a country that is looking after its citizens. That's when you can give the citizen help when he wants it, when he needs it most. So that is what it's all about here. The health sector has difficulties, and I'm happy about the central bank facility that is offered. We shall support it. We shall do everything to make sure the private sector revives itself. But the medical service in emergency can affect anybody at any time. I don't know if there's anybody who has never, never felt that, got into a situation where he needed an emergency. Either uh, the grandmother fell and broke her leg, or somebody had a stroke, somebody has a convulsion, someone has an asthmatic attack, somebody in the village who is going to deliver and can't deliver, obstructed labor, another one has delivered and is bleeding heavily, and nothing can be done for them. So that's where we come in with this new service. It's new. I like all things new that people are skeptical. People say, oh, it won't work. Oh, well, why are we doing that? No. But it is a service that its time has long since passed. It should have been here long ago. But we cannot set up an emergency service like that using the public assets. You have rightly said that 60 to 70 percent of service goes through the private sector. So naturally, there is a partnership that has to be on. This government cannot buy all the ambulances it needs. You cannot employ all the doctors. You cannot do everything that you need to set up an EMT. And in fact, I haven't seen it anywhere. So therefore, we want to use all the assets that are available, both in the public and the private sector. Bring everything together to be able to help ourselves. We are not helping strangers. We are helping, nobody knows when anybody would need emergency. emergency. Nobody knows. You don't know. Some of you say, oh, uh, yes, a phone call, yes, ah, the, the father fell down, broke a leg. In, uh, go, get people to go and carry him. They say, oh, no, he's, he's, shy, he's, he's screaming. He won't let them carry him. Or there's no transport. That might necessitate you flying to the village to go and organize uh, something for the father, the grandfather or whoever it is at the time. But if you have a service by which they made a call, and then the service comes on, knows the correct first aid to give, knows the hospital to go to. Your problem is solved. Some of the complaints we have here now is that there are patients with acute respiratory distress, probably from COVID. They go to a hospital. They are told, no, no, that's not the one. They go to, they go to about three or four. At the end of the day, the, the people will not survive. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't get help anywhere. But with medical emergency system, the ambulance will know exactly where to take you to. And you can call at any time. People who have an idea of first aid will come and get you, paramedics. That's what we are aiming for. And in order to be able to, and then in order to, be able to succeed, we need the private sector. We need ambulances and we need urgent care centers. We need a payment system and we need money. The lawmakers, in their wisdom, put 5% of the basic health care provision fund for that emergency, for everybody. How are we going to use this amount of money? If you look at it, it's not much, really. It's not much. It won't get you anywhere. You can't buy ambulances with it. So why don't use existing ambulances? Government ambulances, there will be enough. Why not use all ambulances, private and, and, and public? This money won't be enough. Why not look for money from elsewhere? Why not look for donations? Why not look for people making pledges? Why not ask insurance companies who insure cars to be putting money in? Why not ask fleet, of, ask fleet operators who carry people every day to be contributors? Because they can be the ones who may need it. They are road accidents. So why not use this money, grow it, and how do you administer it? If people are taking to the hospital today, they're asking for a deposit. You might be a millionaire, but at that very moment, Nothing in your pocket. I don't know how many people have been lost by the fact that they got to hospital, but they didn't get treatment because the hospital was hesitant. You don't know how to retrieve your money. They leave them. 
it happens. Or they leave them outside. They say, oh, no, no bed. Go to the other house. By the time you move from one to the other, you lost the soul. How many souls have we not lost that way? So, dear colleagues, this is a public service. It's a public service that we are embarking upon. And by necessity, it has to involve all people who are in medicine, in medical practice, with all the assets we can muster. All we need is how to organize it and how to assure efficiency, transparency, accountability, so that it will serve and be sustainable. And above all, how to make sure that those who need have an actual emergency problem can be treated without being made to pay. So the idea is that you have an ambulance system where the transport is, the, the payment is assured. So the ambulance driver will not say, well, uh, no money, no movement. So you get to an urgent care center where the treatment will be assured. So you have a system of ambulances that are accredited, a system of urgent care centers that are accredited. You have a committee made up of private, public, working together to determine tariff, to determine modus operandi, and to determine all the activities that you can imagine. And let me say that the emergencies stretch across the entire field. From obstetrics, the other day I was asking family health, they said up to 20% or 25% of the cases of maternal mortality can be as, as attributed to not being able to even reach the hospital. If you add those ones that reach the hospital but they are not attended to because they didn't have deposit to pay, they are going to about 30, 40 percent. We have about 512 now maternal mortality, I think, eh? according to the 500, 512. And about, that's about the worst in the world. If you are able to have an effective, functional emergency medical system, it means that you can take about 25 percent of that of that figure right away. Of that figure, because you can get to the hospital. So the organization which the lawmakers have put down gives 5%. The rest is in our hands. What do we do? My idea, as I say, is that all the health sector will come together as a family and work towards it. We need to grow that money. That money we know is not enough. We need to bring all our assets together. But we want to, all, want to make sure that all those who are rendering this service will be paid. It may, not be, it may not be everything that you need, but at least you cover your, your costs so that you are not left uh, bare and you will not hesitate. I know what you are talking about because I'm a trauma surgeon. I know how many trauma cases that come to you, you do everything and then they can't pay you. And if you know that you are, you are relying on companies who will pay your bills, you, you will not survive. But we need to have a system that can guarantee that citizens, we don't lose citizens. And there are some of them who are very well educated, professors and well learned people who are lost in an accident or in, in, in situations where, which are totally avoidable. I don't know, I mean, you must, know, you must have heard stories of that nature. The other time we were having NCH in Kano, we were told that there was a, a bus bringing uh, uh, doctors, a delegation of doctors, I forgot where they were coming from. Yeah? Had an accident on the way. Half hazard arrangement for first aid. Not knowing where to go. Nobody can take a decision. Many of them perished who could have been saved. So you are losing manpower, very, very, people have been trained at great expense. You can't continue like that. Look at the women, too, who, are, who were losing in childbirth, perinatal mortality. Look at the children. Look at those who have asthma. Just simple asthmatic attack, where one call will take you and you get your, your uh, relief in the first aid center. All those things we can't do at the moment. So that's the purpose for this uh, joint effort that we are proposing. A meeting of public and private sector to work out all the modalities for operating a system of this nature. A model, model for growing the funds. 
Government fund alone will not do it. We have to grow it. We have to be able to get money. Then a model for organizing payment, guaranteeing payment to those who offer service. So uh, the director of media said, I will provide the policy. I'm only asking you the questions. I'm putting the questions before you. And that's why we set up a committee. The committee deliberately, because we know we have good proportion of private sector, brought in private sector operators. Uh, I requested my friend, Dr. Gedegbe, and he gladly accepted. Thank you very much. We have not paid him any penny. It's public service. And thank you very much. I'm going to bring some of you, of you inside to join to work out how we are going to run it. The advantage, number one, you have a lot of ambulances. Number two, you have hospitals. Number three, many of you, you have management acumen. You're managing hospitals, you're managing people, you're managing, you're balancing, trying to balance your budget. You have management. We on this side, well, we're administrators. Not a lot of us are good at management of, of things. So but what we want is a system that functions and functions for everyone and is available for everybody. Available by day, available by night, available for whatever problem you have. That you can even remotely activate. That's what we are looking for. Today I was at the, I was invited to primary health care where they were commissioning motorcycles. The Immunization cover, cover, coverage, which was 30% or so, or 32%, they have man, managed to move it to 70%. Then almost a ceiling there. What is missing? They can't penetrate certain villages, hard to reach areas, rural areas where there's no road, where you don't have a, what they call the last mile. So they have purchased motorcycles. That's what I went to commission. Motorcycles now with which you can go deeper and be able to offer immunization services and ramp it up to 80, 90 percent. That solves one big problem. And I also told them this COVID, uh, COVID challenge, we have a question of collecting samples. We want to be collecting samples in many places. How do we move them? These motorcycles can serve the same purpose. I'll help to bring uh, samples collected to a particular center. So using one stone to kill many birds, as they say, you can solve a lot of problems. In the same way, in order for this thing to work, we all need to bring our acumen together, your management acumen. It's a volunteer work. And this job has brought together so many actors. I don't even know who all the actors are. Well, I know that blood transmission is there, police is there, NEMA is in there. Uh, the private sector, of course, the government is in there because the government is the originator and houses it. But I brought together all those who in any way have anything to do with emergency services. And if it succeeds, uh, it will be the third. Luckily, the World Bank decided that they will support us by hiring a consultant, an Israeli consultant, which the team has been working with now to help to fine tune the strategy for being able to deliver. If it works successfully, it should be sustainable. It will be the third in Africa. And uh, we wanted to copy the model that India is using. We don't understand it very well. I think which company was working with us at the time? I can't remember the first, the first company that we talked to. Do you remember them? McKinsey. Hmm? McKinsey. McKinsey, yes. They are the ones who know, told us about India, McKinsey. But I'm told that they are very expensive to hire. Whatever the case, the idea is to be able to do the basic, the last link in medical service delivery. That's the last missing link that connects. It also connects, because it's also a referral system. You can move patients from primary to secondary, secondary to tertiary, or to specialty. So it's, it's, it's there for that purpose. And the, that ambulance will be paid for it. It's like Uber. You use it like Uber service. My, my thinking is that we don't need to buy any ambulance, but use what's on the ground and pay everybody for service rent, like Uber. I don't know how many people have used Uber here, but, sorry? <laughs> so we all know Uber works. You just call, you pay to a central post, and that's it. 
So they set up accreditation team. The ministry will work on setting up accreditation team, set up the criteria, working with EMT, uh, EMT. EMT will set up all the criteria and standards that will be met. Whatever support we need to give, we give that support. So that is the concept. And I, I think following this agenda, what should have happened was that the discussion should be after, after this, so that having given a general direction of where we are going, we can ask more, a few more questions in order to clarify. And then thank you all for coming. Thank uh, Dr. Ogedegbe. It's like he's, he leaves his hospital there and comes here working with us to set up this whole idea. He's a trauma man like, like me. I've worked, I've worked in this system, I'm telling you, emergency medical service, I worked in it. So I, I, I really know the value. It has value. You don't know how many lives you can save. It has real value. And uh, I've also heard the story of so many people who didn't need to perish, who lost their lives, where they needed just a few, couple of pints of blood and then to, to, to put a tourniquet. That's all you needed to do, just to apply a tourniquet. And, and you don't know if you can apply a tourniquet and you, you lose somebody who is a breadwinner for his whole family. So those are things which, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we want to look at. It's innovative and it's naturally a necessity that it will involve the health public and the private sector working hand in hand. Have I made my point? I am Ambassador Dr. Ike Odo. I'm a medical practitioner. I run Meridian Hospitals in Port Harcourt. I also double as the national president of the Association of Private Doctors in Nigeria. Yes, we, we have come to show solidarity with our health minister because uh, he has been in the forefront of uh, innovations and novel beginnings for our country. As you know, he said that how best to identify, rationalize, or estimate, evaluate the potency of the healthcare delivery system of any country is how prepared, how ready, how competent they are in responding to emergency situations. Because emergencies are those moments when somebody's conditions puts him on the line between life and death. Where one second, one minute delay could make the man who should live cross the boundaries to the other side. And so emergency medical services are critical to the healthcare delivery system of a country. And our health minister is championing the introduction of effective and a world-class emergency medical services for Nigeria, such that when people are sick, wherever they may be, in the field, in the house, in the church, you dial a simple number, 112 or whatever, and the ambulance shows up, as we know it in the UK, in Europe, and in America. Those things are possible anywhere. And so we have come to share with him, to strategize and to interface with the minister and the ministry to see how best this can be achieved for our country. Yeah, the doctors, the doctors, uh, this the program is still in the incubation period. It's not yet launched out. We are trying to launch out. That's why we are here. From the uh, arrangement, a, a national committee was set up to midwife this program. And very soon, the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, and some aspects of Nasarawa State will be you know, uh, brought to the fore as a launching pad for a pilot scheme. Then over time, it will, the ripple will spread to involve all the entire country. 
And so, as leaders, both of the AGPMPN and then the Guild of Medical Directors, these are the two players in the private sector that are going to truly drive this scheme because, as you heard us say, over 70% of Nigerians seek healthcare in the private sector. So we are the drivers. So our members will be informed. Efforts are being made to accredit facilities because for doctors to get involved, their facilities will meet certain basic requirements, minimum requirements. You probably heard me tell the Honorable Minister that for us to do a good job that the world will be proud of, and we will also stand in pride to say, yes, we have joined the community of nations with emergency medical services. We must guarantee standard, we must guarantee quality, we must guarantee due process, processes and systems. And these things cost money. And that's why we are requesting of the federal government of Nigeria to remember the health sector, especially now that it has become very obvious that we are way far back where we should be the health sector is sick and dying, and we need to cure it. One way to do it is by a bailout, an intervention fund. Just like the government has done to support banks to survive, to fund the entertainment industry, agriculture, and all that. Everybody believes that the way to start is with life, with health. So the health sector ought to be the beginning point of every bailout. But as they say, whatever you couldn't do 25 years ago, the next best time is now. So if our federal government, the state government, did not see need to do what? Bring in bailouts to resuscitate and stabilize the health sector 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the next best time is now. We need to save Nigeria. We need to reverse the medical tourism trend from Nigeria back to Nigeria.